hello again, guys. Um, so today I'm I'm going from uh, Quito uh, in Ecuador to Cuenca. Cuenca. Um, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Um, it's a pretty, it's a reasonably big city, um, as you can see, riding through um, villages along the way. End up going really high up into the Andes and spectacular riding and spectacular views. So this is a little bit about Quito. It's a big city and I got there around Christmas time and like so many of the major roads were closed. Like, um, you know, being in countries uh, before where there'd be an accident, um, where only part of, a part of the road would be closed, um, they seem to, in Ecuador, if there's an accident, everything sort of shuts down, the whole road was... And that's what I'm assuming was happening because the following day that road would be open and then another road would be closed. So it was a really tough uh, tough city to get around. And, you know, the, the all the tourist locations are scattered around the city. Um, and, you know, it got a bit boorish when you're, you've got to go 10 miles to a to a uh, to a tourist attraction like the middle of the world that's probably a little bit further out probably about 15 miles but taking an hour and a half two hours you know it was just insanity and uh, you know I've, I've been in big cities before where where it was pretty bad but none like uh, Quito it was and maybe it was just the time of the year but it was uh, it was a pretty tough um, city to uh, to navigate. Um, the Google Maps and all that worked fine, but you know, I there was the, the because the city's in a huge dip in the valley and up on the mountain range. It's um, you've you've got limited limited uh, roads to get to where you need to go to, and then sometimes you just got to go way out of your way and then back around if a road was closed. So maybe it was just around that time of the year. Um, and maybe just a couple of serious accidents that caused it, but I was pretty sick and tired of Quito by the time I'd, I'd left. Um, so today's trip was, you know, just a nice slow journey. Um, yeah, again, you know, uh, a lot of trucks and stuff like that, although I think uh, Ecuador does have a freight rail network. Um, it was a pretty, uh, a pretty, pretty tough old day um, and, and um, with just passing truck after truck after truck however the scenery was you know once I got up into, um, into, into that's one of the, the towns that I stopped in at um, this is another town this is actually the road you have to go through to get to the other side of the town and you'll see we'll, we'll ride through this town um, uh, soon um, And uh, I think the town's name was Al Ale Usa, A L A U S A, but it was on a spectacular. This is after I've crossed through the town. It's in a spectacular valley and really steep climb down into the into the village. Um, and you, you'll never see it from the video how steep the climb it was, but you can see I've already come down part of the way, and, and then I've basically got to do a right turn. I wasn't really sure because it was telling me I had to cross through the city to get to keep on to uh, to keep on the, the highway and I wasn't quite sure I was thinking well the road just keeps going round why would I cross it and uh, I wasn't 100% sure which way I was going um, but anyway it was a pretty a very pretty town I was thinking about stopping here and then checking things out um, but it was a pretty really pretty town and you find that when you go through these, you're looking for spots to take photos, you know, with your with your helmet camera. Uh, unfortunately, the helmet camera's on the right side, so I have to really pull my head around to get to get a good photo. Um, and with the drift ghost, I, I can just click on it and just do continuous photos, like once every few seconds. So I shift my head around to the left to get a photo, and then I, you'd hear the click sound, and then back again. Yeah. So it was um, it was a pretty pretty uh, pretty spectacular town. I'm, I'm going pretty slow as you can as you can see.
and I'm, uh, I'm actually, uh, I, I, I think I get a little bit lost at one stage because it was telling me to go up really tiny little streets um, and I wasn't really 100% sure which way I was going but But I ended up making my way to the other side and uh, a similar type of road that just swept around all the mountains. It was pretty cool. Um, but I am lost here. The problem is, is that these towns, Google Maps will tell you which way to go, but then you end up with, uh, what you end up with is you get, end up with one way streets that you can't go down. So then you've got to work your way around. And you know, I'm just sitting there just checking out the sat nav all the time thinking, which way am I actually going here? Um, and then some of the, some you know, some of the uh, streets aren't marked whether they're one way or two way, so then you've got to stop and think, oh, well, is there any which way the cars parked on the streets and stuff like that? So this one, this one again wasn't marked. Usually there's a sign up on the building that has two arrows or just one arrow uh, pointing in the direction the traffic goes. But again, it's just a matter of. So I think that this street ahead was a one way, so I have to just look at the car, so I, and I keep going. No, I've worked out that I've screwed up here. <laughs> this happens all the time in, in old towns. Yeah, this guy's told me and I'm thinking, oh, I'll just get to the next street. Because there actually is no signage and the Google Maps will actually tell you, oh, well, you've got to go this way, you know. So I'm just hoping I don't get any traffic. Or police. So this one might have a, 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 an arrow here. Yeah, you can see on the right building, it's got an arrow um, a, and a street name. And then, then I go down there, and then sometimes they have the, the tiles marked in a way that the arrows are going the other way. And you think, well, what's going on here? You know? um, but it is worthwhile. I'd already, uh, I'd already had breakfast, so I wasn't going to stop in this town. But it is worthwhile stopping in a lot of these places if you can just ride around a little bit, find a, find a little. Usually, they have a little town square with some gardens and benches, and usually some cafes and sometimes some street food around. And a lot of the times, those little town centres are really, really pretty. Um, A lot of uh, yeah. So this is a this is a bit of a tourist town. There was some a lot of so you can see the four wheel drives there. A lot of um, uh, expedition tours from the town, but everything just looked weird coming through and having to go up streets like this to cross the city just done, didn't feel right. You know? Pretty cool though, isn't it? Again, you'll get some topes, uh, little speed humps in the, in the town. Always really smart to go really, really slow. You just don't want to have a re any reason whatsoever for the police to, you can see the arrow on the right there, uh, and for the police to pull you over at all. And that's because mainly in Central and South American countries, if there, I didn't witness any corruption, but I was always warned of it, and um, and it's in the smaller towns the the local police apparently they always talk of everyone always tells you the local police really corrupt, you know, uh, the the military police no they're not corrupt at all, but you know I mean I never I never witnessed any of it for the for the most part I. I only had really good interactions with all the police and military and all that sort of stuff. I'm sorry, I'm swearing here because my maps are telling me I'm not on the right street. So yeah, I ended up making my way out of here. Um, and there was a little bit of road work, so I think I had to do a little bit of a U-E. Uh, we call it a U-turn in Australia, I think you call it a hairpin in the US. Or, no, you call them switchbacks, that's it. This guy knows where he's going, I don't know. And I still do. I 
felt like I felt that going down was better than going up because I thought I had to go down to the bottom first before I could go back up. But um, so the, the the plan for me was to to spend one night only in Queen in Cuenca, Cuenca, Suenca, Suenca, um, and then make my way to uh, to a city near enough the border, um, you know, maybe 100, 150, 200 miles from the border, and that was going to be Vilcabamba, um, Vilcabamba, and um, so I was only going to spend one night, yeah, still got no idea where I'm going. Um, but you'll find that, uh, you'll find that you're not going to get any of the miles out of the day that you would think you would get. Um, I'm just talking at the moment saying, well, it says turn right there, back there, but there's no road there. Uh, but you'll, 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 you'll have this issue through a lot of towns where the mapping just doesn't work the way you think it would work. Um, and you just got to deal with it. And the best way to do it is uh, the paper maps will get you, uh, will be a lot better for you. They won't tell you which way is one way, but at least you'll see how to get out of the town. Like a little screen's not going to do that for you. So sometimes I would sit there and I would uh, I would get I would stop in the village and then get the, the, the map out and then just look okay well that's where I've got to get to that road there I can look up you know especially here I could look up on the mountain say okay I've got to get that way so I'm just going to make my way out there so sometimes you'll end up with a dirt road that you've got to go up to get to that road but it's just the way it is I feel a little bit more comfortable now I think that I'll in the right direction. I still didn't feel, actually, no, I can remember this because I still didn't feel that comfortable that I had to cross the whole city to continue on, but that ended up being the case. Um, it was really pretty though. So, so basically, um, getting from, um, getting, getting out of Keto wasn't too bad. As I've said in the past, you've got to leave first thing in the morning. Now I feel a little bit more comfortable, but the, to the views are just absolutely breathtaking. So with the with the Drift Ghost, when you put it in shooting mode with video, and then you have it in photo mode, it, do, it takes uh, uh, in the four three aspect ratio, which is a bit of a pain. It'd be nice to shoot it in the widescreen aspect ratio, but any photos taken while you're shooting video is in the 4-3 aspect ratio, which is, a little, which is a little bit annoying for editing. But this is the sort of roads that you'll get all throughout Central and South America. Uh, the major highways, this is the best of it you'll get. There's some better, some are, some are newly laid roads, and when you get close to the cities there, just like any other road, so I imagine. Um, there, there is, for, on this trip, there's a lot of, uh, lot of road works uh, the whole, on the whole trip, um, especially on Route 40, uh, as you get down into Argentina and Chile, um, and Route 5 and Route 7, there was a lot of off-roading and a lot of park places that weren't uh, paved. But, yeah, I mean, it's a spectacular riding. And the thing about this sort of riding too is you'll, you'll go through different weather for the whole day, so it's all, it looks all beautiful and sunny, and then you'll get to, uh, you know, 50 miles up the road and it'll be cloudy and overcast and a bit of drizzle. So you have everything every day. So if you're going to be, um, you know, if you're going to be riding and, and you know, <clears throat> not everyone can afford the climb gear, um, and so if you're going to have your wet weather gear, have it in your backpack, you know. Um, have your, your coat, your, your pants, if you, if, you, if you have wet weather boots, uh, uh, boot socks like the stuff, look at that view. Um, if you have that sort of stuff, put it in your, uh, put it in your backpack so that it's going to be very quick for you to transition from your, um, from your normal gear to your wet weather gear because you, it could be beautiful and sunny the one hour of riding. Oh, I just love I just love that. Um, beautiful and sunny one hour riding and then the next hour you might be riding in the rain. So it's just always uh, always smart to be prepared with that sort of stuff. 
And as far as packing your bike, is you always want to always want to be clever about that. So basically, I, I had quick access to. Uh, I, I knew in each bag and each box exactly where I had everything. The first few weeks, you'll sort of get a little bit confused, but when you're packing everything, pack everything into separate bags. So your clothing. So I had my clothing and uh, and some of the camping stuff in one bag. I had the, the drone. Um, I actually had the drone in with the clothing just for extra padding for the drone. And I didn't use a drone case. I had an air dog uh, drone, which I'll talk about later. But look at these roads. Absolutely spectacular. Um, and the other bag. So I'd have soft stuff in the bag that I, was, I wanted to protect something with. And the other bag I'd have my camping, my camping stuff like my camping mat. Um, sleeping bag, etc., etc. So the bags were, were were clothing and camping stuff, and then in the side cases, one side case would be my camping equipment like the stove and all that sort of stuff, and the other case would be all my tools, and then on my back case, I'd have all my computer equipment. Um, and the thing about it is, you wanna you wanna um, you wanna take. Uh, you want to make sure that your um, the the stuff you've got is going to be right for the job. Like, as an example, if you if you want to edit videos, you want to have a proper uh, you want to test the computer to make sure it can edit videos quickly. Um, I'm I'm just doing these quickly, you know, I'll, I'll do these videos quickly. But you can do transitions. You can change the the colours of the scenery and all that sort of stuff make them deeper if you want um, but that that you know for these type of videos just want to tell, tell you a little bit of the story about each day's ride and just do it I'm going to do some bit more heavy edit, head, heavier editing uh, with it so so uh, as part of today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the, the editing process and the storage process so a like I've, I've selected, I put everything into ride days when I was traveling. So I'd have ride day one, ride day two, ride day three, and I'd talk, I'd say from what point to what point I was going. And then I put all the photos and videos at the end of that day's trip into that folder. So whether I've got the GoPro, my, T, my Olympus TG Tracker uh, Action Cam, my Drift Ghost Cam, and, um, and then obviously with my phone, I've got photos on my phone as well. Now, so that so what I do is I put everything into the one folder. Okay, I'm a, a really key thing for all your camera equipment is to get the time and date stamped exactly the same within the seconds, because you want to when when you upload your videos to, to store them, you want them all to be in the order that you've that you've been writing. You know, um, so it's in a, a sequential order. Um, I had a little bit of problems with the GoPro when you took the battery out for some reason and set the time back to 2015 and that would happen to some date in the past which was freaking painful um, and I'd have to keep resetting it. I don't know that it was just an issue with the one camera but it was annoying. Um, and so uh, you can you can set the date and time with the, with the GoPro on your phone, you can set the date and time with the Drift Ghost on your phone. Um, and then you basically want to set it to the camp to your mobile phone one, uh, the same time as what's on your mobile phone. So what what will happen at the end of the day? I put them all in the folders, and then what I do, and making sure that all the all the times and dates on all your devices are all set the same, and then and then what I would do is I would um, I would upload the photos because most of the time you're never going to be able to upload the videos because they're too big a file size, and you won't get the good enough internet access to uh, to do uh, to do that um, you, you, you just won't um, you, you know you unless you want to stay in a five-star hotel that might have decent access but even then I stayed in a few of those on my trip and I didn't get good access there either so um, if you want to uh, if, if, if a smart thing, if you if you had the time to do it, would be to edit the videos and then save them to your device, so that you're not having as big a file sizes, um, and that that would obviously make some sense as well. 
So let's go through that again. Have your, have your video, all your camera equipment and your phone set to the exact date and time. So by, to the second if you can. Um, and then create folders on your, on your laptop for each ride day and put all the photos and videos on there. So you want to have a decent sized hard drive. So if you've got like, you buy a MacBook Air or anything like that, you might have to have a, uh, like get a lacy tough, uh, tough case. Um, and, uh, and, and what you'll do from there is you will, uh, you'll store all your videos on that. You don't want to have a normal hard drive. Uh, if you're going to have an external hard drive, unless you can really protect it because it, you're going on a long trip and something can go wrong with bumps and bangs with one of those drives. So you want to get a, a protected one. And really one terabyte drive is going to be way enough for a six month trip with videos nearly every other day. Okay. So you just got to, um, just got to be wary of that. Um, and, but keep everything in ride days. And so uploading photos. So the only tool you should use is Google Google Photos. You, you might be used to Apple Photos and good for you, but n n nowhere near as good. Nowhere near as good. Um, and you can do so much more with Google Photos. So um, so what I do is uh, once I put all the photos into one folder and then uh, and videos, and then what I would do. I would take the um, I would take the uh, uh, all the photos from that folder and upload them to Google Photos, and then I'll create a, a folder, an album in Google Photos, exactly the same name as the album on my computer. Okay, and then with your phone, if you've got Wi-Fi in Google Photos, it'll autom automatically back up all your photos on your phone. Um, it'll just do that for you, no no issues. Okay. So, um, so you want to put all those photos in that album as well. So basically, at the end, at the end of the trip, you've got everything neatly organised, and you can go back into those. So when I got uh, got to um, Santiago, Chile, um, I, I, I there was an Airbnb that was advertising, you know, 100 megabyte download uh, internet connection, and I was able to upload around about 30 days of videos using that connection, which was fantastic. Um, and so I, I just uploaded them and then what happened I, I uploaded them into the albums I created so you can just drag and drop them all into the, into the album once you've got the album open and they'll save them to that album I know I'm taking some wide turns here but there's no cars around um, but uh, yeah so that's the way you, you do that and then at the end of that all the photos that Google will automatically create certain photos and and, um, and if you've got videos with them Google will automatically create like a little short one to two minute video of your day it sort of selects out you usually have to do some editing and you can edit any of the videos that Google automatically creates themed videos you can edit the title you can edit the the music that it plays with it you can edit the uh, the order in which the photos and videos appear and usually Google will take about a one to two second part of any video and put it in there so well worth it, uh, and, and not only that, you can download them, you can edit the videos like you can with Instagram, the photos, sorry, as you can with Instagram. The only downside I have at the moment to Google Photo, there's two things that I, I'd like to see, and I've already written to Google about them. Number one is, if you forget to put something in an album, it doesn't let you know what photos or videos are unassigned to an album, and that would be good to have. So then you can go and clean everything up and make sure you've got everything neatly organised. Um, the, the second thing is the video editing is not available on the, through the browser on the desktop. It's only available through the app, either on your Android device, the Apple or Android device, whether it's a, um, a tablet or a, a phone, which I find annoying because it'd be great to make little, little videos for your uh, for Instagram for instance little one minute videos on your desktop you know just be, because it's so much easier to control um, so that's a little bit of annoying thing annoying feature of that and I'm sure they can do it I'm sure they they will do it so I mean for someone like me who's got well over a hundred thousand photos and videos um, 
I'd like to know which ones I haven't assigned to albums and it should be just a button that if it's if photos or videos out of an album it'll just give you a whole list of them and you can just assign them. And there's a couple of statues there you saw there on the left hand side. You, you get that quite a bit. Um, um, and uh, so I'm getting messages. So yeah, so I suggest that with Google Photos you learn uh, you learn how to use Google Photos. Um, just it just makes sense. You can see now that all the clouds have moved in, and uh, it's pretty uh, you know we're pretty high up in the mountains now. Um, but yeah, so the weather is completely different here. And then you get out of that this town and, and, and go up, uh, go down a little bit through the mountains and through some valleys, and that's better. Um, but yeah, with the Google Photos. Uh, learn it before you leave. Learn all the different features. There's plenty of websites that give you little tutorials on how you can do different things with it, but you're going to find that that's an invaluable tool. And on the app on your phone, um, make sure if you're going to if you're going to import all the, if you're using a GoPro for instance, you're going to import all the photos to your to your phone. Then make sure Google back when you install Google Google Photos, it'll tell you. Uh, you can under the settings you can say you want originals which you want to select even though uh, they are larger file sizes you get to keep all the originals it does a really fantastic job if you don't um, as far as the photos go uh, but you want to keep the original photos and videos the second thing the second setting you want to make sure is ticked which is ordered ticked by default is that it'll only back up your photos and videos when you have a Wi-Fi connection so um, just going to an internet cafe or a cafe that's got internet access, get their Wi-Fi password and we'll just back them up. Um, so the, 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 secret, the secret is to is to be to be pretty smart about um, about that because you don't want to be paying any phone charges for backing up your your photos just to make sure that to check that that's uh, the case. So number one setting is make sure they only upload originals. Uh, and then number two is that only backs up everything when you've got uh, Wi-Fi. And then you won't have any problems, and you'll, it'll be one of the better thing, better decisions you make for your trip. Uh, Apple, the Apple uh, Photo app is just nowhere near as good. The other software I use is, uh, is Wondershare Filmora uh, for the shooting for the videos. Um, I only use it at the moment on the basic thing, but it's got a whole lot of uh, settings. I think I think Premiere for, for the amateur, Premiere Pro and Premiere from Adobe are a little bit overkill. There's a lot steeper learning curve. Um, but uh, I mean, you may already have that. So I mean, that's a fantastic uh, uh, application for, for editing videos as well. But it, it became it, be, it became a bit of a hassle. Like I ended up with, by, by the time I got to Santiago, I had about 500 gigabytes of videos that, it, that had yet to be uploaded. So, you know, it, it does become quite, quite, uh, quite a, a tax on you so uh, now as far as the computer equipment goes um, if you're going to be editing videos then you want to have the uh, you want to have a good graphics card and a good uh, CPU power so any of the latest model uh, Macs will do it and uh, and PCs as well uh, but get something that's light you know I used a MacBook Air and, and I've got an old MacBook Air and I've got a MacBook Pro my MacBook Air was I think it's a 2011 version, uh, and I've got a new MacBook Pro, which is a 2016 version, uh, and I took the MacBook Air because it was lighter. Um, I thought I'd be able to do some video editing on it, but the, the laptop started. It was a mistake I made. I should have bought a new laptop before I before I left, and I ended up having to um, buy a uh, buy another laptop, uh, a Windows one, just to do some video editing. Because when you do video editing, um, the one thing about Premiere and the, and the Adobe Final Cut Pro, which I've got, it takes a long time to render videos. It's just the, the way they are. Uh, 
it's not for quick, you know, quick edit and share. It's for more, a bit more professional, uh, and that's fine. But uh, it does take a lot more CPU or graphics power. So you don't want to be get, taking a laptop with you and then finding that just to edit a video is taking you four or five times longer, like taking you hours rather than uh, rather than minutes. You know. But if I if I had the time, what I'd like what I would like to have done is is got all the videos from the day uh, and then done a quick edit on them and then saved them to the computer. So saved the new version of the computer. Another thing you've got to be careful of is when you edit videos that it doesn't change the, the date and timestamp on the video um, because otherwise when you upload them they'll all be in different orders depending on when you touch them or modify them. And you can do that in the settings uh, in any of the main, main uh, uh, video applications. So as you can see, I'm coming coming back out of the, the clouds again now. Um, it was a good, it was a good day's riding. It was just a long day. I think about eight and a half hours, about nearly 300 miles, and that's the maximum you're going to get out of a day. Um, but between the big big cities, I, I used to do some pretty big miles, um, and uh, and and I always used to stop. I've said this in previous videos. I stop all the time. So I'm always stopping in towns for a 15 minute break. As I've said previously, every two hours, a 15 minute, minimum 15 minute break of riding. And then if I'm off roading, I'm, I'm braking every hour. It's a lot tougher on your body to, uh, uh, to continue uh, to, to just ride all day and do long, long stretches. Um, some other riders prefer to have their brakes at gas stations. Not a fan. Uh, it, it, Gas stations in all the major countries um, have like food and stuff like that, but it's it's uh, it's not nice food, you know. Nowhere near as nice as what you'll get on the streets, you know. Um, and you'll find that when you get the big long, see this this is some of the street food. See that like that's a pig on the spit there, freaking amazing. Um, it, and you just try want to try to avoid all the uh, when you're riding, avoid all the fatty, fatty foods, um, like uh, all the oil and stuff with all the, um, they, they just love putting batter on basically everything and then frying, which is not very healthy and um, quite, uh, you, you, I mean, for me personally, I get, I get tired if I have a, a fattening type meal like especially with fried foods, I just get tired. You can see on the left there, another barbecue. I, I stopped at one of them, I can't remember which one. I had a bite. And, um, so I'm trying to remember where I was here. I wanted a red light, so there you go. You don't get many traffic lights, I've got to say. Um, some towns have them. Uh, I remember I was in uh, Bolivia and I was at traffic lights there and I went through this town and there was a traffic light. Like, I remember leaving at like 6 a.m. in the morning and there's like 20 traffic lights to go through and it's reasonably got 20,000 people town and every one of them was red and like taking minutes. There's no sort of uh, thought for the, uh, for, you know, where there's no sort of pads to let them know that people are in lights and there's no traffic going the other way. It's pretty, pretty painful. A few times I just looked around, no one was around, I just skipped through them. No. One of my favourite places to stop was, uh, a lot of them had some really cool uh, bus step shelters. So I used to stop at a lot of bus shelters and usually in some pretty cool places, places as well. Um, uh, stopping off at a bus shelter and then being able to lie down because I don't like because you've been sitting on a bike, you don't really want to sit, but you don't want to just stand. And so normally, like I would try and get some, maybe some street food or somewhere from somewhere, and then put it in my tank bag. I, had, I always carried some plastic bags in my tank bag just in case there was any food that could leak. And then I'd just get on my bike again and uh, and ride to a nice spot where I could relax and take 15, 20 minutes to have a break. Um, now, as far as gas is concerned, you're going to find that you've got to get into really, really good habits with, with your gas stops. And that means any time, 
you know, you can work out where all the towns are before you go and you should do that. But um, always, always, uh, um, whenever you're getting half full, if you see a gas station, just get into the habit of stopping, even before you leave, get into the habit of stopping at half, half full. Because it just, you, you know, there's probably, on, out of all the riding I did, there's probably only four or five times where I really got worried about gas. And that's because in Chile and, and Argentina and, and places like that, you'd, I would find there'd be gas stations that were out of gas, you know. So you'd plan it, and then all of a sudden every plan goes out the, out the window. Um, and I never had to uh, knock on doors, which some people have done where they had to uh, knock and see if they can get by some gas on somebody. But I did run out once and, um, you know, that just running out of gas and I was only three miles from the from the town, but I was on an uphill so I couldn't walk the bike um, and uh, ended up, it, I was lucky I got a lift pretty much immediately. I got someone to take me to the gas station, a security guy, a highway security patrol. They took me to the gas station, got me my gas, and then we drove back to the bike. Filled it. They waited for me to fill up uh, to, to get it going again, and uh, I was on my way. But um, yeah, you don't want to go through that. And uh, that was that day was because basically two gas stations were out, and I had to make a decision to go back. Um, and that, that very day, because there was uh, gas strikes, I ended up having to go about 50, 70 miles out of my way, uh, go back the way I came to go back to a gas station because the, the next one was uh, out of gas and the following, the other one was out of gas as well. Um, yeah, it's just a, it, 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 it happened in Argentina and Chile more than anywhere else where, I mean, when I entered Chile uh, from Peru, the, the distance between gas stations was pretty crazy. Uh, I wouldn't be riding a bike that had that less you could do that had like a 250 a 250 mile range uh, without having extra gas on the back. You can buy you know get a couple of gallons you can put on the back and you see riders with that all the time, especially on the Kawasaki's and some of the Hondas and stuff like that, where their their range was like 200 to 250 miles. They would always have the extra gas gas on. Um, through, through these countries, I didn't seem to have much of a problem, but Chile and Argentina, two of the more advanced countries I did. Um, and Peru, there was a couple of spots in Peru where, you know, I would, I would be three quarters full, but my next gas station stop was, you know, uh, 340 miles away. And uh, I basically just had to then fill her up again. Um, you know, once I got to three quarters, I just, I went to a gas station, filled it up like five dollars or whatever and then got on my way again. You just got to get into those habits and if you don't, you're going to pay a pretty big price. Um, and like when, when I'm in Miami and, uh, and back in Australia, when I was driving cars or motorbikes, you know, I'd wait until I was pretty much empty. I knew that my KTM here, I had about 60 to 70 miles once it said I had no miles. Um, but yeah, that nervous thing, you just don't want to have to deal with it. Um, because you'll, you'll soon know when you run out of gas and it's not good for the bike either, especially the newer models. So um, you, you've really got to plan plan that that sort of stuff to a T. Um, and you, you'll learn that as you go. And the thing about the thing about this sort of riding is you learn so much about, uh, about all the processes you need to go through as you're going through the processes. You know, that my first stage was, was um, was getting rid of stuff, weight off my bike. You know, I, I took all the things I needed plus ex, some extra things. You know, I had like multiple copies of this, that, and the other. I'm giving people freaking money just for standing on the road. Um, and uh, I, um, so that was the first thing I learned is to get, get rid of the weight off the bike. The first stage was ridiculous. I met some people on the way that had just as much gear on the bike, if not more than me, but um, it's just it's just a hindrance, and especially when you start going off road. But the second thing you learn is is how and when to eat and, and how much water you'll need to have uh, 
how much um, water you need to have, and then the, the third thing would be the gas, you know, managing your gas all the time, learning about it, and you know, you should never just go out, uh, get, get on a ride without planning where you're going to be stopping, at least a rough plan of where you're going to be stopping for lunch and, uh, and uh, gas and stuff like that, um, because you know, there's some big distances as, as you get further south. There's some big distances between between um, a gas stations, and it's just about it's just about managing everything and, and, and being smart about everything. It's as simple as that. Um, so Cuenca, uh, one night there, um, I stayed at a pretty nice. Was it, it was a just a hotel just out of the out of the town a little bit, but it was a, a nice sort of hotel. Um, a little balcony. Um, I was able to park the bike, uh, securely park the bike in the car park downstairs. Um, yeah, decent room. Quite modern, but a little bit, the modern stuff can be a little bit sterile, but you know, a, a good place to relax for the night. I got there mid afternoon, got checked in, did my normal routine, which is to. Uh, check in, unpack my bike, put some fresh, uh, have a shower, put some fresh clothes on, charge all my devices, and then I'd go out and have a look around the town, then come back again and um, and do some work, um, and back up all my photos and videos, make sure everything's charged, pack everything up, again, get everything ready and organized so that I'm only spending 10 to 15 minutes in the morning uh, getting myself ready to go again. Um, it's a process that you'll go through, but having a routine for doing it just makes it everything a lot easier and you don't forget to do things, you don't leave stuff behind uh, and stuff like that. So it's just all about, um, you know, I mean, I operate a business and the best businesses that, that, you, that you run and operate are businesses that are run in systems and the same thing works having a system in place for, for, for your every day doesn't make it boring at all because it's just getting shit done and, and not saying, okay, I'm getting back to the hotel, I'm just gonna relax tonight and then I'll worry about charging stuff later because you'll forget to do it, then you'll get on the road the next day and you won't have any battery in your phones, your cameras and all that sort of stuff. They, they might fill up with the memory card, all that. That's another thing I had. I always had about four or five spare memory cards uh, for, the, for, the, uh, for the cameras. So just in case something went wrong with one and that did happen, um, that, that you've got spare ones to, you don't have to go out looking around shopping for crap, you know. So yeah, so I'm now about, I think I'm about 20 to 30 miles out of Cuenca. Uh, nice little town, little historic area, old, old part of town. Um, and uh, a little bit cooler too. It was up, it was, it was in a, just a, in the foothills of a mountain range and it was quite a pretty little place. Um, big river running through it. Um, but I only, again, I only spent about three to four hours looking around the town and, and then I was back on the road again. So, uh, yeah, I need a couple of little photos to finish off with at the hotel that I stayed in. I'm not 100% sure if I put them in here. Um, nice sort of road coming into town. So that was, yeah, that was the, the hotel that I stayed in. It's about $65 a night. Nice little view up, right up at the top there on the right hand side is the old part of town. Nice and pretty. But yeah, a good little trip and uh, not, so, not so hot that night too. So that was, that was a nice change. Nice and clean rooms with, the, with some balconies and stuff like that. So it was pretty cool. All right guys, as, as you always, questions and comments below.